Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Hank Cisco Show. Let's go. Welcome to the Hank Cisco Show. I'm Barbara Anzippi, executive producer at Chow Bella Living Italian Style and columnist for the Delaware Valley Italian American Herald. And I have to say, proud to be a fill in host for our buddy Hank Cisco, who all of our viewers out there love and send him best wishes. So, on to some Italian news. It's ma amazing the things that we're learning. Um, Famous scenes in Italy. If you're going to the movies, and I know you've seen many movies from Cleopatra to Under the Tuscan Sun. Well, the How one about tea thing, with Mussolini. Tea with Mussolini. Well, that that's great another movie. one. <laughs> so when you go to visit Italy, there's a couple of places that you can see. One is the Royal Palace of Caserta is actually featured in Star Wars. And it's episodes one and two, the attacks of the clones and the phantom menace. So when you go there, you can try, if you're planning a trip to Italy, stop there. Also, that same scene's been used, which we're showing on the screen, in Angels and Demons and Mission Impossible. The other place to visit when you're going to Italy, if you're going to be west of the Tiber River in Rome is you could go where Julia Roberts taped Eat, Pray, and Love. And over there she's eating gelato from the Crisperio Gelateria and it's right by Piazza Navona. So it's not a hard place to find and you too can have your gelato in the same scene where Julia Roberts um, has it. So whether, the only caution I will say is if you go to the Trevi Fountain where that's famous for the three coins in the fountain. Throw the three coins in the fountain and not you because they do arrest people if you decide to go into that fountain. <laughs> if you're traveling to Naples... You know that from experience, right? I do. I have a personal <laughs> connection to three coins in a fountain. I'll have to share with you in the future. Um, a new exhibit in Naples. If you happen to go to Italy and Naples is in your travel itinerary, from now until June 21st, 2020, the, um, the Capa di Monte Museum, who are famous for their ceramics, uh, they have this museum on an exhibit of porcelain, lava, and music. So it's a beautiful exhibit and something that you might really um, want to see. When you're in Italy, and or in a conversation with people, and we talked a couple weeks ago about how Hanna-Barbera Hanna is responsible for all the costumes, characters like Fred Flintstone and Casper the Friendly Ghost and all the things we see. Well, ancient Romans were also inventors pre what we see today. And a couple of the samples, I had to take pictures um, to show you, were uh, one of them is a actual takeout and delivery establishment in the ruins of Pompeii. You could see where the line was for the people to pass and to get their fruits and vegetables. Um, they also, in those ruins, have a postal service depicted in a Roman, in a Roman wall uh, carving, which means that in ancient Roman times, they did have a courier way to deliver mail. And the Appian Way, many, many of us stop at the Appian Way as our trips to Italy unfold. And that was constructed over 2,000 years ago and is in better condition today than modern society roads. And it's a visible and a very viable road still um, prominent today on your trips to Italy. So there's so much news, it's all exciting, which leads me to some news that I'm going to share with you about my next guest. Um, one is I want to congratulate Nick Elmy for making the cover of Philadelphia Magazine. Um, it's great to see a young chef on the cover of Philadelphia Magazine, and our guest today has a personal relationship with him he's going to share. And also, 
Oh, I forgot about this one. If you're Molise, if you're from Molise in Italy, or you like the Molise area, it's Italy's smallest town, and they plan to grant people dollars to stay in their town because it's less than 2,000 residents. The Italian towns that have less than 2,000 residents can encourage new property owners. While Melise is making this campaign, well, they'll give you 775 euros monthly or 24,000 euros yearly as long as you commit to staying in that town with a business for five years and developing and living in that town as well. Now, for all of those millennials out there that are traveling and working from their computers all over the world, uh, I think that sounds like a pretty good deal. Are so, you kidding me? I'm on my way. I'm serious. Let's go, I'm Barbara. I'm serious. <laughs> so now, bringing me to the news and Avellino uh, Campania in southern Italy, um, they actually share a sister day with um, North Jersey. And one of North Jersey's most famous residents is Joe Piscopo. And they'll show you now a picture where I had the pleasure of being invited to a, a function where Joe was the MC by my next guest. And it was a heck of a night to get to meet such a great personality and be among great company at the Devon Prep School. So I'd like you to welcome my guest, Silvio Lelli. And Silvio is the CEO and founder of Nationwide Wine and Spirits. Welcome, Silvio. Hi, Barbara. And, and thank you so much for uh, inviting me today to the show. It's, it's a wonderful experience. And uh, God bless you, Hank, uh, Cisco. Hope everything is uh, okay. And uh, how lucky he is to have you. I, and like I said before, when I first met you, I, I feel like you're, you're akin to my sister. I have a sister named Fiorella. You got to meet her. That's a beautiful name. We call her Fifi, as a matter and, of fact. And you know, Hank Cisco, he's so funny because he just loves his Italian, so I know <laughs> he loves you. And Bruno, Silvio and I met at the um, press club's function where we had art on display and we had so many beautiful things happening at Echo Hill Farm. And you were pouring this different wine right. from... You have to tell us about this, this wine because it's so cool with Halloween right around the corner. So this, this wine is called Actum Sinister, and it's obviously a Halloween wine because it's in a coffin. And uh, I even do a commercial where I dress up as Dracula and I say, uh, you know, only in Transylvania, I, I, I mean Pennsylvania. And it's uh, 11 dollars in your state stores. Uh, the grape is called Bobal, B-O-B-A-L, uh, which right. is uh, in, an incredible Pinot Noir-ish type of drinking style grape. And where is it from? Valencia, Spain. Now, this is what's really interesting about you, Silvio. So many places feature wines from Chad's Ford or the Cape May region here in California or from Italy. Right? right? So your wine is coming from what countries? This is amazing. So uh, when I first started Nationwide Wine and Spirits, uh, I decided to uh, import earth-friendly, family-owned, um, uh, small production wineries, mainly from Italy, France, uh, and uh, some, some California, obviously. Right. Um, and I was also doing sake, believe it or not. So, um, and, and because I had to find a niche in a, uh, a very dominant uh, conglomerate uh, type of business in order to outflank them, sake was the way to go. So premium sake, not the stuff that was meant to be served warm. Right. So I went through different uh, stages in the business where I, it took off. Uh, then it would settle, plateau, and then I would have to find the next big thing, which the next big thing was, um, you know, s small craft uh, distilled bourbon. And I got in on that in 2009, 2007. I was doing the sake and the 
small production wineries from uh, from Italy and France. And then 2009, um, I got into uh, uh, small craft bourbons. And then thereafter, um, at one point, Italy and, and France and California just became too expensive. Right. And I had to find the next best thing that uh, over-delivered for value uh, compared to the wine. And, and what's an interesting thing about that is it shows the reinvention that we all take within the many reinventions of a small myself. business owner goes through. You yeah. have to go with the time flow yeah. and with the age group. And today the wine and spirit industry is blossoming around the world. So, so you focused, you ended up your focus in in, in, in Spain, Portugal, and South Africa. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful yeah. mix. Yeah, and, and the South African wines are, is called Saxonburg. Um, and it's in an area called Stellenbosch. In 2002, I married a woman from South Africa. Got to meet Christina. <laughs> Thank you. And we went to the vineyards uh, in Stellenbosch. Stellenbosch is like the Napa Valley of South Africa. We drank some wines at a, a winery that's been around since 1693 called Saxonburg. Oh, amazing. Stellenbosch is beautiful. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, above Cape Town and above that you have uh, what is called Table Mountain. And it's absolutely, Cape Town's like a Mediterranean villa. Table Mountain, uh, when, when uh, uh, the evening starts to settle in, the, the, the clouds look like they're actually um, pillows on, on the table and it's just gorgeous. The wines are incredible and there was something about the, I put my fingers in, in that uh, grainy pebbly soil and it carried in all the wines. And I said, wow, that's, that's, these wines are just absolutely incredible. So 2002, we went there for our honeymoon, got to meet some winemakers and went to the vineyards. 2007, uh, with the grace of the good Lord above, I, I started, and I don't know why I, I was so naive as to think that I'm going to start a wine and spirits wholesale import distribution company in the state of Pennsylvania, but I did it anyway. And it's usually a big business, uh, big business opportunities, and you did do a very successful small business venture that has grown so well. It's amazing to right, see. Right, right. And, and one of the things that another reinvention, well, before I get to that, let me finish South Africa real quick. So, so as I said, 2002, we went to, to the winery on our honeymoon. 2007, I started Nationwide Wine and Spirits, which, by the way, you can find uh, www.nationwidewine.com. under your name, right. <laughs> and then... Um, in 2018, Saxonburg came to me because in, in 2017, uh, my company was voted as importer of the year. 2018 came along and they said, do you want to import our wines? And I was like, are you kidding? They, didn't, they had no clue that we were on the winery at Saxonburg uh, Vineyards and that we were uh, sampling their wines at their restaurant called Guinea Fowl on because they got a little Guinea Fowl. Boy, so is that a blessed connection. It, it was just amazing and it's doing so well. And uh, like the Chardonnay got a 90 from Wine Spectator. Uh, you know, the next episode of uh, Wine Enthusiast is gonna feature uh, some of those uh, best value wines. And it was just incredible. So that's how the uh, South African um, proposition came along and and talking about reinventing oneself uh i before i became a winemaker my first company was a film production company it was called dauphin films and it was in manhattan and um and i started that because prior to that i went to villanova university i was just going to ask you because of what your degrees were in yeah. and you'll have to tell us about your so it's, it's in communications and, and English. From Villanova. From Villanova University. Although English is more of a minor, uh, it was just so darn hard, honestly. But it was a great, great experience at Villanova. And I went to the department head. And at that time, I wrote my first novel. It's called okay. White Moon on the Horizon. And oh, it was based, I'll have to read it. It was based on everything I did in the military prior to that. I enlisted, it was there for four years, stationed in Sicily traveled the world which i was going to thank you for your veteran service oh thank you and that's that's and, and why the branch of your service that's why uh, i wear the pin uh, the pin 
It's Villanova and a veteran. Right, uh, and the, your branch that you I served was, in? I was in a helicopter squadron called HC-4, which is, has since been decommissioned, and it was uh, in the Navy in Sicily. And fortunately, I was in Airedale, because one thing I learned about the Navy, as per to me, myself, and I, right. I can't stand ships. Okay. I, I totally had. And you were, had two, to be on a ship the whole time. Two, no, no, no. Fortunately, we, our helicopter is the largest in the Navy, the CH-53 Echoes, that whenever we went aboard ship, the, the flight uh, um, captain or the, the, the air boss would be like, get that helicopter off the ship because we always got in the way of uh, flight ops. Okay. Because of the, because of the size. And we, we stayed on a, a board uh, a helicopter ship called the USS Saipan, which is actually has been uh, decommissioned. decommissioned also. I wonder if it's at the Philadelphia Navy Yard. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know about that, but interesting enough, um, because we rarely stayed on ships, I got to stay at like different ports uh, throughout Around the, the Mediterranean, uh -huh. through, through, through uh, uh, the Middle East, through uh, uh, Africa, and we got per diem. So I was living large. It was just- You in, have really been around the world, which leads to your tagline of the wine entrepreneur, because you have a, a TV uh, program too. Would you right. give us a little thing so, about that? So um, going back to when I started Dolphin Films, it came from directly from a time when, when, uh, when I went to Villanova, I went to my department head. I said, look, at that time, their liberal arts uh, program was starting to blossom. In fact, they built a new building. And I went to my department head, and her daughter just shot her first uh, um, uh, documentary. And I said, look, hire a screenwriter. Teach me how to write a script. You know, I'll give you whatever time I need in order to make this happen. And then you guys will have a curriculum that you need and want for your liberal arts. And they did it. And I would say that that was probably my first big deal um, because I, I gave Villanova uh, an extra year. I was able to write a script. Uh, I, I wrote a script about Philadelphia, uh, South Philly meets the main line. And, and thereafter, I had the, uh, um, the audacity to start a, a, a film production company from money that I made as a waiter at a place called Kansas City Prime, went to Manhattan, found a business partner, and we started Dolphin Films. It is amazing where your your young career took you. Oh, yeah. Because you are also a graduate of uh, Devon Prep, I, I, we have to add, right? Well, I actually, and I, I'm sorry to say that I did not graduate Devon Prep. Okay. I went, I went from seventh grade to uh, tenth grade. Gotcha. And... Um, but I, your son's going there now. And he will graduate from And there. he will graduate from yeah, Devon Prep. Because he, he's doing phenomenal and he loves it. And it's such a great quality school. And that is terrific. And it was, I mean, being around you, the little time we've known each other, we're out and about on the streets and it's been a lot of fun, <laughs> uh, I have to say. Um, I, I definitely have, um, I, I have five older sisters, as I was telling you, Fiorella, Marilena, Patricia, Rosanna, Lorenza. No other brothers in the family? No other That's brothers. That's a big Italian family. S S Silvio. In fact, my, my father, coming from Italy, my father and mother are both immigrants from, from Italy. From where? Abruzzo. Abruzzo. Right, right along the Adriatic. Yes. And uh, from Giulianova, from Colonia Spiaggia, and Rosetto di Abruzzo. Okay. So, um, you know, the Italian males have a thing about having a boy, so they call me Silvio the King. Of course, with five sisters, we all know how the Italian and, women treat and, their sons. And that's why Hence I have the crown. Hence your king logo. So let me tell you how I got the king logo. Okay, uh, because make it quick, because I have another question for you. <laughs> There's nothing quick, but I got great stories. Okay. So when I had the film production company, I went to Sundance Film Festival twice. Okay. At that time, I've already gone skydiving like five, six times. A couple times tandem and a couple times solo. It's okay. called static line. You pull, okay. It pulls the, the cord for you. So the one thing I knew how to do was how to fall. Okay. So when I went to Sundance, I decided that I'm going to learn how to ski. And, and all my life, I was looking for this uh, monarchy. I was like, well, why am I the king? You know, why has this been assigned to me? Where can I find this? I ended up going to um, Park City, Utah, 
And it was the year before, it was, I think 1999, it was the year before the 2000 Olympics. Olympics. I was there right after the Olympics. Gorgeous, Beautiful gorgeous town. place. And um, at that time, I was trying to watch as many films as I possibly, I, as I possibly, possibly uh, as I could, could watch. Right. And and I decided um, to take a skiing lesson, and I ran late for the skiing lesson. So instead of taking the skiing lesson, I pulled a couple of teenagers aside. I said, "Show me how to go left. Show me how to go right. And show me how to stop." And they're like, "Okay." So left, right, stop. I was like, "I got it." I'll go down a bunny slope tomorrow, uh, the net the following day, I'll, I'll take the uh, ski instructions. So when I got in line, I thought I was in a bunny slope. Here was a double black. Double wow. black diamond. Oh my goodness. Right? First time I ever go skiing. The guy in front of me, his, his girlfriend fell down and, and he helped her up. And as he was helping her up, I, I asked him, I said, is this the bunny slope? And he said, yeah, can't you tell? He was being funny. And, and slightly sarcastic, but I was being serious. He was like, yeah, can't you tell? I was like, oh, okay, great. So as I got onto the chair on the lift and we're going up, I'm watching everybody uh, skiing. I'm right. trying to learn as, you know, as, as they're skiing along. And I didn't realize how far up I was going because I was looking down. I got off the chair, the first thing I did is I fell, which was great because it was like a practice fall. The guy, okay. helps, the guy helps me up. So I get uh, on the line and I, and I get down like this and I start, boom, I'm, I'm flying down the slopes. And, I'm, and, I, and I suddenly realized that I am a locomotive out of control and I very well could die. So of course I, I kind of picked myself up a little bit and it was, it was at a, a, a point where, uh, you know, I had to decide how, how am I going to survive this experience? So I figured, okay, Go back to what the kids taught you, left, right. So left, right, I'm actually skiing. I'm going left, right, left, right, left, right. I'm going down, I'm actually making it. And then as I got to the, uh, to the, to, to the bottom, I literally skied down that hill. Okay, I got to the bottom, I saw that wall, and I was headed to that wall about 100 miles. It felt like 100 miles. I was more scared at that point than when I went skydiving, jumping out of a plane, right? I was so absolutely frightened, and I had an epiphany. I was like, what am I going to do? I, I got to face my fear. I got to take my fear straight on. What do, what do I do? What do I do? Fall. And that was the whole experience. And when I fell, I fell perfectly, and I felt like, a, a, it felt like I, I fell on a bed of... of angels' uh, feathers, uh, it, it probably. Was, it feathers, yeah. It angels was, must have saved you. I had no clue how to... Oh, totally. I had no clue how to get out of my skis at that point in time. I actually had to, like, I didn't know how to get off from the skis. So I had to get out of my skis. I'm jumping around. I'm screaming. I'm like, yeah, I did it. I did it. And people like staring at me like, what's wrong with this guy? Later on that night, as I'm driving by, I look at that, uh, that, that slope. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, it, it's absolutely gorgeous, all lit up. So I asked one of the, the ski guys, uh, the instructors, that, that protect the area at night and I said can you show me a trail map and he opens up the trail map you know the name of that that trail no king's crown king's crown yeah so I finally got my crown that is an amazing that's, story that's the logo you are an amazing guest <laughs> I have to Thank ask you, you is Please. it gravy or sauce in your house it's definitely it's definitely gravy it's definitely yeah. gravy and what is your gravy consist of uh, well, it, it depends on the gravy, it, uh, kind of mar marinara with bolognese with some sausage, and uh, it's just a, okay. a, a, a meat-based gravy. Meat-based gravy. And right. with all those sisters. And, and, and tomatoes that, that have been grown, grown. in the garden. Right. And with all those sisters, how do you, they, you must be spoiled beyond belief. You have I'm, to be. I'm blessed. You are blessed. blessed. Now you'll have to tell our list, our viewers out there, how you connect it with Nick. Nick Elmy. Elmy. Well, you, you said I have a personal connection, and I, and I, I kind of don't, and I do. Okay. I know him through another chef uh, named uh, Alex Garfinkel, and my company is actually sponsoring an event for Parkinson, and Nick Elmy and Alex Garfinkel are going to be. 
uh, the feature chefs at, That's at that great. place. And you know, I know you do a lot of charity work. You do a lot of giving back. I'm trying. On your, uh, with your success and what you've done in, in your lifetime. Uh, you, you have to, yeah. And you, you gotta treat everybody uh, with dignity, no matter what point they are in their life. And, and you well, have to, I'm sorry, Well, on. you know, one of the things I, I like about you, Silvio, and about your life, is it's a great lesson. We're being taped at the Norristown High School with students from it. the juniors and senior class. Yeah. You woop, know, woop. how many times, <laughs> you, you know, do you actually use the college degree that you have for the end result of your career, right? Right, right. So it's, it's, it's wonderful to be able to have a career where you do reinvent yourself and you take everything on as a challenge yeah. because it leads you to the next reward. Right. Which happens to be when, when um, so I had Dauphin Films, and then I, I fell into Wine and Spirits. Well, actually, Wine and Spirits fell into me and, okay. and chose me, and it became a passion because, to me, every grape tells a story and every vine is a lineage. So whether the grape is, is uh, Veronaccio di San Gimignano, and it traces back to San Gimignano, Tuscany, with the beautiful towers, but this is the wine that Michelangelo himself was drinking. It's amazing. I love those things. It's amazing the stories that can go with some right. of the, cre the wine creations out there. And today, there's an awful lot of uh, um, different uh, bourbons are making their uh, comeback. Yeah. You know? Oh, uh, huge. Big time. Uh, a lot of liqueurs are coming. Negroni, we were just talking about that, and Campari on one of the prior shows. A lot of the industry is re resurrecting a lot of the old. Do you right, find that? Right. Well, that and, and it's mixed with um, marketing. That's why you get a wine that, you know, Bobao, the great Bobao from Valencia, Spain, which right. is a beautiful DO, denomination of origin, is a wonderful grape, and it's the third largest production grape in Spain, but yet us Americans don't know about it. So these guys got creative and created Actum Sinister in order to, and created this coffin. You know, I, I can't tell you. It was a cool, that was very well received. Yeah, it was cool. And everybody loved it, didn't they? Oh, the I'm, taste I'm was beautiful. I'm not just saying that either. No, taste was beautiful. The price point's really nice. Eleven ninety nine. The creativity is really cool. Right, It right. really is, especially Perf for Halloween. For Halloween, and it can be found at the state stores, the premium state stores. The code is 1446. Okay. The year I first <laughs> tasted blood. I, I, I mean wine. <laughs> so you yeah. have to be creative. So you you're putting your script writing to use. You're putting your wine education to since, use. Since day one, I've been entertaining my five sisters. So I've been- Where, do you, where are you on the scale? I'm, I'm the last one. You're the last I'm one? I'm the youngest. Your father kept trying until he had a boy. <laughs> oh my God. And, and, and um, it, it was just a, an amazing experience to, to, to be in that and, and to be an entertainer and eventually accept yourself as an entertainer. So my passion, in fact, at one point I created a, a demo uh, of me just selling wine in the streets of Philadelphia at different really posh restaurants like the Union League, 1862, uh, Ruth Chris, La Familia, uh, Le Castagna, which all is no longer- All delicious, long, right, but all which delicious is no long, restaurants. But, but delicious, great restaurants. And I went up to Food Network and Food Network's like, ah, I think it was something about just being wine uh, kind of threw him for a loop. But when I w went to um, a, a show, I was introduced to a show called um, CEO Chat. And I sat down with these guys, Al Cini and uh, Joe. I don't know how to pronounce Joe's last name. I apologize, Joe. Um, but Al Cini is actually the son of, um, of uh, the, the, the famous Philadelphian who was on The Godfather. Okay. Who sang Al? Al Martino. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, oh, so, C I N I is Al Martino's right. That's right, it. Right. That's it. So, so I was on the show and I showed him my wine. I showed him my true personality. I didn't hold back. You know, I'm, I just. I don't be, think you can hold back. I don't want to hold back. Okay. I just want to be myself. I think everybody needs to be the, themselves. Everything's. Too, too corporate nowadays, too politically correct. Everybody's so uptight. Get over it, people. Just be yourself, you know? Just, just have fun, and that's exactly what I did. I opened the bottle of wine right on set, and then the owner was like, 
you know, uh, we have a show, it's called Cooked and Uncorked, but the last person didn't make it, they did five episodes. I was like, let's go. And we've since done 48 episodes of Cooked and Uncorked with famous chefs, and essentially it was me just pairing a wine with a guest chef's cuisine. And how can they f see old episodes of that is under you, you know what, go, and Uncorked? Go, Go to, you know what, if you want to watch the best episode, which was Grand Cafe L'Aquila, go to nationwidewine.com, and there's an episode posted right on my website. Good. Right? Okay, well, and, so we can and, see that. And I have since, once again, I like being myself, and sometimes because I am myself, I rub people, especially uptight people who are just too anal retentive about everything. Okay. I rub them the wrong way. And no. You know what? Yeah. I you mean imagine. some people don't like you, Sylvia? That's and you know what? That's fine. And the and the owner of that network uh, decided that he didn't like me, and he but he doesn't like a lot of people, including himself. And he decided, you know what? I don't want to do the show anymore. I'm like, fine. Because I'm going to take that show, I'm going to bring it to Clifton Heights, where they, where they film uh, um, Sprout. Right. And, and we're going to use that studio. And then when, uh, when you're ready, we're gonna, you and I are going to link up together, and we'll do Ciao Bella, living Italian style, together. Oh, we oui. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure you have a lot of plans. You know, um, you, you must have a little bit of Hank Cisco uh, aura around you. There's, because there's a difference between having a lot of plans and, 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 and trying to plot it all out. And, and make them happen. But, and, but the important thing is just do. Just keep doing. So you know? if we were going to so talk about. So many people about plan and, and they plot and, and, and they say, oh, you know, a, 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 a goal without a plan is just a wish. That may be, but you got to be a doer. You got to be a doer, and some of this must have come from the way that your parents um, raised you in that household. My father was an electrical engineer. Um, my mother was a stay-at-home mom. Um, you know, God rest their souls. I was the only one who who broke out of of uh, you know. I, I did school plays when. I played Scrooge when I was like eight years old. You and know, that's a like wonderful that. thing to be able to. But nobody was in the restaurant industry and nobody was in the entertainment industry. It's just something that. Or the wine industry. Right. I mean, everything that you did, you know, uh, when, and you're, what generation are you here? First, second? Your grandparents oh, came from Italy? No, no, my parents did. Your parents came from right. Italy. So first generation, you know, and it's funny how. Uh, my dad was first generation. He served in the Kore during the Korean War. Oh, nice. And it's funny how a lot of first generation I, I Italian in the Gulf Americans. War. Right. Thank you for your service. I did it for you, Barbara. I, Specifically. You know, <laughs> I'll tell you. Uh, I know. One day I'm going to be Barbara a, Zippy. <laughs> the value of a veteran. Zippy. I is, love that name. Is a major. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm very proud of it. <laughs> um, but the value of a veteran to us here. I wish I had realized what it was when my dad and my uncle uh, yeah, were but, alive, because they didn't talk about their military service from World War II. He, one uh, it was World War II, one was Korea, and they kept it quiet. They, they were the real uh, warriors. It, today's wars is very much push-button war, um, uh, uh, but the guys that actually go to Afghanistan, <laughs> And who have gone to Iraq and, um, like I said, I served in four military operations. Operation Desert Storm, Desert, Desert Shield, Desert Storm. There was a civil war in Africa, Liberia, that, that, I, that I was part of. And then oh. after uh, Desert Shield and Storm, we did Operation Provide Comfort. That was essentially setting up what is now like Kurdistan and northern Iraq. Right. So I was really fortunate. but. My job was not on the front of the front lines. Front lines. And, you know, I, th I thank the dear Lord that I wasn't. Because the last thing I want to do is take a life. Yes. And, um, and you, you want to come home safely. And you want to come home safely after well, all of that living a life. Because a lot of veterans have a little bit of an adjustment period though, and are having difficulty with that adjustment there's, period. There's a, there's a group. I'm looking at my, my sleeve and I notice there's a little bit of wine on it. <laughs> um, there's a, there's a, a, a different of, um, there's a group called Bunker Labs I was part of, and it was essentially mentoring um, veteran entrepreneurs 
uh, to be more successful in their business. And it's actually, uh, it's, it's grown quite dramatically. That's great. We were at uh, 1601, uh, the WeWorks building on, on Market Street in Philadelphia. Uh, they're doing an amazing job. And I think that's the angle that needs to be taken. It's not necessarily veterans that are, you know, disabled or they need a hand up or, no. The trick is to empower people with the gifts and talents that they already have. Right, and there are some who do need those other services and need to be helped along, and it's good all different ways. St. Joe's has a great program, too, for right. veterans. My, um, my, trying to think of who runs that program, Harry. Uh, my, my buddy Brian Brogan is one of the, uh, one of the uh, uh, assistant directors professor over there and uh, he introduced me to the vet over there and the and program is really uh, right. uh, off and running they had one of the big and ones Villanova, and Villanova Michael Nova. that's why it's it's Villanova veteran and just so what happens they're both V I think um, when you're in the military right they they train you to be all you and and to be so self-sufficient but yet to be part of a team. The problem is when there's a disconnect after the fact, the, the veteran is no longer part of, of a, a team. team. They have to find their new team. And, and they feel, and that's, that's the trick, is, is to surround themselves with like-minded people that can um, be cooperative as a team member, but yet still allow you to uh, be the best that you could possibly be. And, and that's where a lot of veterans fall short is that they're no longer part of a team and, and they feel and that... And they need help finding that direction. But they don't want to ask for help because they're so proud. Well, right. And, and we're making it a little bit easier today. There's some programs out there and, and we want to encourage that. Too know? many veterans have committed suicide and it's, it's, yes. it's an absolute shame. It is. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that, you know, they go in certain parts of the world and... They get banged up in their head, you know? Yes. And they got to get that, yes. that, that head trash out. You know, I met some... they got to talk through it. I, I met some uh, Korean War veterans yeah. uh, who were in combat. And it was interesting to hear how they watched their words. But you could tell that they were actually physically in physical combat at that time. Right. The weapons are nothing like they are today where your enemy could be so far away. And these people these men and some women who actually made it through during those times um, are amazing. You know, they're resilient. Um, but your story shows that we can, you know, the pride that you can take in the military, the pride that you could take in your family background, because at one time Italian Americans were not looked on as um, middle class, upper class people. They were looked on as the labor that came over to do the jobs nobody else wanted to do. I, I think my generation was there was a transition. Uh, transitional shift in the way the perception of Italian Americans but that goes through with the Irish Americans and and the Chinese Absolutely. Americans they, they all go through that uh, conversion process and and eventually become in a uh, uh, part of the affluent or the middle it's class. It's what history is called, right? Right. It's history. It's, it's the evolution beautiful. of history and it's a beautiful thing. There Silvio I can't get you to go into another story because <laughs> they're giving the me that wrap-up <laughs> signal. But you have been an amazing uh, guest, um, a new friend, I'm happy to say. Thank you, That Barbara. I look forward to many of our adventures to still come in the future. I want to thank our um, viewers out there, thank our team at Norristown High School, and teacher John Doyle, because I haven't mentioned his name, and I know Hank Sisko always does too. And Hank, if you're watching this episode, thanks again for the opportunity, and see you soon. Ciao, Bella. Ciao.